Okay, I'm going to run through a few of the pieces of work I did, uh, not just me, but a group of people called Peng. Um, and I'm going to put up one or two uh, claims or ideas or whatever you might call it and uh, round it up with a proposal. What we do, uh, basically, I mean, this is kind of the, the analysis I would offer you, that right now we have an overflow of parallel crises. They are all happening, and it is very difficult for a young generation inheriting this world not to be completely resigned. So my impression is that much of what we have, uh, were fighting for for a while as a pro progressive social movement is already lost. You mentioned the two degrees and so on and so forth. And we are now entering a stage which is kind of a regressive 68. While during the year 68, there were many progressive movements joining together, also fighting each other, like you know the, the communist uh, homophobes and the bourgeois uh, homos, uh, whatever. Like They were not all like good together, but there were many progressive movements kind of joining together and, and creating what they call the, the 86 revolution. Um, so I believe in many progressive parallel and also regressive movements happening at the same time. And right now it seems that we have a bundling of regressive movements that kind of take over. Um, so how can we fill this, post, uh, this, this feeling of deep resignation? I don't know where to start. There's so many informations. I don't know who to believe. Um, I don't know what's right and wrong, and so on and so forth. This is kind of a disease of the, the, the you know, Generation Y, or whatever you want to call it. But also for me, again and again, I feel that. So with Peng, we try to give an answer to that, and then it's like, just start somewhere, right? And I'm going to give you, sometimes we I compare ourselves to like secret services, civil secret services, nonviolent, important nonviolent secret services, but we try to like interfere um, and have fun. So one of the typical things is just to say stop, right? Um, it's not just we don't always do elaborate research and then do a very uh, intelligent, uh, complex action. Sometimes it's just, you know, go there, do it, and, and leave. Um, the example I took here is uh, when we got <clears throat> the opportunity. There's a, the German Nazi party called AFD. Um, and they, um, like the, the neo-Nazi party, that's the old one. Um, and we, we got a dump of email leaks uh, that hackers sent to us because they believe it's better in our hands than somewhere else. So we knew where they would meet for the, their annual general meeting to prepare the party's um, program to be elected before they then finally were elected power. And we knew where they would meet. So that means that all of them come to one spot in Germany. Um, and, and we knew their internal fights because we had their emails. Um, and uh, we knew the hotel, the time, and so on and so forth, which was a secret location. And we just booked a room. We, we wrote a manifesto, uh, which was called the Total War, which is a word game of like the tart and the total war. Of, that's, that's the claim of this propagandist. Uh, back then, who said we, we should all go to a total war, and we called it, we said that we, sh we should go to a total war, which is a pile war kind of war game. And uh, we wrote this manifesto where we took quotes from the, the Nazis, this is now in German, um, where we basically just, when they said we, uh, the Ultima Ratio is to kill people if they cross the border. Um, that's what they say in the news to then be, you know, everyone is disputing that, you can't say you should kill people again, blah, blah, blah. and they say, oh, that's not how I meant it. And we just took their quotes and, and said, and, and like changed the borders to moral borders and changed like arms with pies. So basically... Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. You might have heard is that I was singing happy birthday, so they, they think it, like everyone thought, oh, it's her birthday. And she thought, what the fuck is happening? <laughs> and, you know. Uh, no, it was not Petri, it was um, uh, Storch. And the, the guy who defended the second tart with a Heil Hitler, yeah. uh, <laughs> you can see that is Albrecht Glaser. He's, a president, he's the third uh, president of. He's the oldest person in parliament right now. I mean, for once it helped, right? There was a purpose for this. 
Um, so uh, we didn't have a photo first. I mean, it's a long story. Uh, she did one. She posted it. So the internet did memes with it. Like there were thousands of remakes of her with a with a pie. Um, the, it became a movement. Every time they've got a demonstration, there's a pie. Um, they did a pie catapult. <laughs> they, the, obviously, the, the big newspapers asked if it was paid with taxes, because we're artists, and artists live off taxes, right? And it was fully said by the Minister of Culture that uh, nowadays we're not in the Weimar Republic anymore, and art is free. So the pie was basically, the minister said that the pie was art, which is quite funny, mm -hmm. because it clearly wasn't, it was just a pie. When they have official meetings, the, this Nazi party, the cops are securing the bakeries. <laughs> it's, I'm, not, I'm not joking, it's happening, it's happening. And you know, also left parties, like it became a, a thing when, whenever a politician would say something Nazi-like, he would get a pie. Here is someone from the leftist party. Uh, who got a brown pie. That was just an interventionist thing. We don't always do like complex things. We sometimes just throw pies, right? The idea is basically to scatter power conglomerates. When we approach a, a, a complex topic, uh, or, or when we want to think about what we can do uh, as, a, as a group, we look at where is the centralization of power. I, I mean power quite, I'm one of those like Foucaultian discursive uh, postmodern children. So I, I love this whole, um, yeah, well, whatever, call it post post postmodernism or something, but uh, so it's also, it's not power in the sense of military or something only, but in the, in the complete. Um, where does it harm? I mean, if you have got a certain cultural power happening, it's fine that you don't all pee in your pants. I think that's okay. That's a norm that has a sense. It doesn't harm us. But uh, ob obviously we look at where, uh, where does it harm, where is it not good for social justice, and so on and so forth. And how does it operate? So we then look through habitus and, and codes of communication. And we talk about sabotage, right? We talk about you know, all these uh, hacks and, and glitches in the society. So obviously, we're, we're following through. So I mean, e examples for all what I said, um, what these, these complex discourses of shit is, or like, danger, or power, conglomerates, they're, they're everywhere. And I'm just naming a few here. Uh, like patriarchy, weapon industry, you can see in the first two ones they're extremely different. Obviously, the the weapon industry is full of patriarchs. When we worked on the weapon industry, it was only men we talked to, only men, and it was the first time, uh, part one secretary, and it, it was the first time that we did this theater performance where no one knew it was theater performance, and we had to make sure it's only uh, body-abled white men who are invited as actors, which is so unqueer of us, and we felt so bad, but otherwise it wouldn't have been realistic uh, in the weapon industry part. So um, climate change, inter the intelligence industrial complex, all these are, are some of these, and obviously what we talk about here is nationalism and the border regime. And I'm ju gonna jump into this one first, this is 2015. Um, it was just before a lot of people came uh, to Europe um, and we started a video. Let's see if it works. Wir fahren hier seit Jahren in den Urlaub und bisher war die Fahrt immer etwas Entspanntes. Aber heute bin ich aufgeregt. Am Anfang waren wir ziemlich mulmig. Ganz egal ist es ja nicht, was wir hier machen. Ich finde es einfach unfair, dass ich mich hier frei bewegen darf und er nicht. Wer hat denn das Recht, das zu entscheiden? I have taken many risks. I had to cross the Sahara and the Mediterranean Sea. Even here, in Europe, there is a risk, but I need to reach a safe place. Manchmal muss man sich einfach aufraffen. Wir haben ja auch irgendwie Verantwortung. Wenn es darum geht, irgendwelche Waren und Geld durch die ganze Welt zu schippern, dann klappt das mit der Reisefreiheit meist recht gut. Aber wenn Menschen fliehen, ganz egal aus welchem Grund, dann werden Mauern hochgezogen. Wir reden immer von Freiheit und Gleichheit für alle. Aber wer sind denn diese alle? Es ist ja schließlich reiner Zufall, dass ich in Deutschland geboren bin. Und wegen diesem Zufall kann ich einfach die Berge genießen. Aber für viele Menschen ist hier nach wie vor eine Grenze. 
der aufgegriffen wird, wird abgeschoben. For most people in Europe, those borders are invisible. Why can't it be like that for all humanity? In der Geschichte gab es schon öfter Fluchthelferinnen. Und das war in den betreffenden Staaten nie legal. Doch das eigentliche Urteil wird nicht vor Gericht, sondern in den Geschichtsbüchern gesprochen. And then cheesy music fade off. Future, you know, emotionalization, and then comes two, two quotes from a, from someone who uh, did like uh, help people cross the border from Eastern Germany to Western Germany, and says that's all, like laws are bullshit and Dublin is bullshit, la la. And the certain person, uh, second person, is a Jewish uh, uh, supporter. Uh, there's no no English term for that, right? The the people who help people um, cross borders. So we launched a website. Uh, we gave a lot of tips at how to do it to, you know, like um, make your car look like it would be a nationalist car and like with little flags. And um, <laughs> you, there are many details you have to take care of, like uh, take a, one of these car cardboards with a name on it. So it look like with a city on it. So it looks you just took a hitchhiker. Um, And you s you can say, well, uh, why should I control passports? You're a hitchhiker, right? And don't have too much cash on you, otherwise it might look like you were paid for it, and so on and so forth. It's not all um, uh, uh, updated anymore. It's from 2015. But still, if you want to uh, go for a holiday and you want to take someone back home, we launched that during holiday time, right? So that people then take people back home. Um, <coughs> we then created a fund where we... Uh, collected money to make sure that if someone is being caught, we pay their their legal processes. And um, we had like a, a billboard campaign and we distributed this in Germany. I mean, like, send it to a lot of like activist friends throughout the cities. And they put it everywhere. And this is like, the, if, if you see the video, it's very much like a car advertisement. And this is like a Red Cross advertisement. Like, I, I spend bl my blood, you know? This is like, we, we basically, we take over codes of, of the, here, the, the, the codes and habitus we look for, the kind of enemy is not just the state, but is the general, like, uh, privileged population. And what is, are their codes? It's like the mainstream media. It's like advertisement, it's emotionalization, and all this shit. So we just, yeah, try to talk to them like that, the way they listen, right? Um, it's uh, this is just next to the Ausländerbehörde, the foreign like the the place where they try to push people away. And uh, then we created the first uh, medal of honor of the European Union for those who made it, um, and they did it before the campaign. So it's all like people who kn who are known for doing it, who were in jail already or who, who send a representative because they, they are not uh, officially known. It was at the Brandenburger Tor in front of the EU dependency of Germany. Uh, th that's like very conservative media picked it up in, in a very positive way. It, it's like the headline is help refugees to cross the border. And that's the Welt, which is a rather conservative one. Uh, it was international press, um, so it worked very well. It was about 700 people who did it, just an estimate because They didn't tell us they did it. It's just more the whole emails we got. We, we supported people to find the right routes. So who had, had we got like pictures from family reunions reaching us and, and like invited, were invited to marriages and so on. It was very impressive at the, at the time. Um, <coughs> I mean, the whole time was impressive. Austria obviously did the opposite. Uh, the identitarians made a border patrol <coughs> and they copied our website called Grenzhelferin then. But no one saw them because, I mean, it was, it was like, their video has like, I don't know, 50 clicks or something. Um, and the Austrian parliament, because there's this Austrian billboard at the border of our video, they discussed in the parliament if we are a terrorist organization. Um, obviously, we were a terrorist organization, a US Zionist think tank that is trying to destabilize uh, Europe. That's usually <laughs> what happens when you do something um, and neo-Nazis try to figure out who you are. Because I put Iron Rand Institute in the who is of the website, so it was obvious, right, that we are who we are. Um, the funny thing is that you can ask the German state for uh, act of legal, like legal act of information. Many letters went to the German Bundestag asking if we are a Zionist organization trying to destabilize Europe uh, from the Ayn Rand Institute. 
and um, then the, because all these questions to the, to the state are being pub published, right? It's like transparency stuff. And the Iron, state, Iron Rand Institute then sent their lawyers to make sure it's taken off the internet. <laughs> so they had to censor the questions if we are Zionists, which is, yeah, I mean, this is just like, you know, funny stories. Um, and this is a video from the identitarians like a, a week ago. A week ago, the, they now start really to do these like machistic pictures, um, how they are defending Europe at the borders. Just to tell you how the one thing was 2015, this is a week ago, right? Um, helicopters, uh, they're, they're really there to stop the migrants. I think that's the Alps. Yeah, it's, it's really painful, but uh, they, they are getting very strong in... in yeah, it's kind of, yeah, kind of Sieg Heil. What we could do here, uh, now that Soros is gone from Urbanistan and say, you know, there is this uh, very strong identitarian movement uh, coming up, we have a lot of resources here in the room. I'm sure there's like so many people who research on that in bits and pieces. There are all these passports uh, uh, projects you have here uh, that we could create a, a border crossing institute. Uh, like generally looking at, and this is just an idea I have, right? It's just a proposal. Um, we could try to get funds for it. We could do it very officially and try to get together all knowledge, practical knowledge, really practical uh, knowledge and research on how to uh, build up yeah, an institute that does following things. For example, uh, technological development. How do you create passports? Uh, what, what can you do to like make the state create a fake passport for you? Or uh, what can you do to create them yourselves? And so on and so forth. These whole Photoshop things and how to basically get people into Europe who need to, be, uh, who need to survive. Uh, what can we do? Like, how can you uh, obfuscate and get through borders without being seen? Um, yeah, I mean, it looks funny, but you take $20,000 uh, and you take a bulldozer and you go through the fence, right? It is possible. I mean, it's physically possible. Uh, you just have to check uh, how's the legal situation. Maybe you have to write an algorithm and a, and a, and a machine, which is like um, somehow like taking the bulldozer to do it without a person sitting in it, like a self-driving bulldozer. So then it's not clear who did it and who is responsible. Um, if it's the internet, right? If it's like you just have a bulldozer and the internet is, is like it's online and anyone can do it, then um, I, I mean, here I'm just thinking like what can we do to make sure uh, the, the borders are broken and being more transparent for not just information and, and uh, drugs and uh, uh, goods, but also for human beings. Obviously the good old ladder system, right? Like if you have six fences, how should the ladder look like? Uh, you need a truck where you get like a letter that gets people down. Legal research. For example, there's this EU regulation where air company needs to pay the flight back and I think some, some punishment if they illegally bring someone into Europe, which is not being tested on the highest European court. It is like, after all I know, it is not going to win if, we, if someone would assess it and attack it. Only thing is all the big company, like the, the uh, aviation companies don't do it. So we could like, uh, again, we, we, we went through the mass. As it would cost us 40,000 euros to get a little plane and to basically bring people from the Ukraine to a non-international airport until someone catches us and then we go up to the highest uh, rank of the EU and we just break this regulation, which would lead to um, not just, uh, then basically the airlines wouldn't have to check the passports anymore, which they do, um, and they would have to staff up, up the cops, which would just mean that the institutions are having a, a, yeah, a capacity problem. But it has not been tested and we could do it. Um, what kind of visa application and corporate tricks are there? Uh, how can we like, um, um, under, uh, like subvert the, the border guards? I'm sure there are many people who just want to do a, a normal job like their dad, and find themselves in horrible, terrific situations. And maybe we can, as this institute, try to, to create a trade union uh, that is looking at the, at the working uh, conditions of border guards. Yeah, and obviously I just took this from the program of this um, conference, right? Because uh, I felt it fits here. 
Yeah, and then obviously training it. I don't think about white people doing it on the, for themselves, but I think about like uh, having training camps with people uh, uh, teaching themselves techniques, trying to find out how we can do it. In Melilla, part of Spain, in Morocco, there are so many people who, would, who are there for two years and they would just wait for people to just work with them and to find out how you can get over this fucking fence because that's what they do all day. And uh, so they have a lot of knowledge. They can really tell you where the loopholes where who got over it and how, and they've got great tricks and some like who are still there don't. So you could try to get people together and, and yeah, and try to get a Marquean bulldozer or something. I'm just giving you this as an, a starter. There's, there are many ideas, for example, on international waters. If you've got a German ship, what happens if you've got a German lawyer talking to you, representing you there, and over a representational body asking for asylum in Germany? Does it work, does it not? All these things we can try out. And then basically bring people on ships, of German ships on international waters, and then get asylum cases. Maybe it's not possible, maybe it is. It's not just not being tested. Um, yeah, and then just smuggling, 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 just, you know, as a research program. So I'm saying all that, that was just, you know, the, the part for this conference. I also work on, obviously, with all this campaigning we do, uh, I, tr I then thought in the beginning of this year, let's think about an ethical um, grounding of what we do. You saw, for example, this video, which is very emotionalizing. That's um, is it one of the, I, so I wrote the Critical Campaigning Manifesto, which is uh, like Julian Oliver, who is also part of the, of the uh, exhibition, I just um, was inspired by his critical engineering manifesto, so I took the same uh, CI or whatever and just copied the website and wrote another text into it. So this is one of the, the rules I would just give as an orientation, as an ethical orientation when you work in campaigning and media work, that you don't do it to survive as an organization, that shouldn't be a priority. And if you look at most organizations, this is their top priority. So. Um, the, and I think that's a huge problem in the NGO sector. It is a huge problem in the arts sector. And it's, a, yeah, it's in, in most of the sectors which are trying to be progressive, first of all, they try to survive. And whenever there's a state or corporate lawyers who try to make it difficult what they want to do, they just won't do it. Or they, yeah, that's a, that's a problem. So I, please look up critical campaigning um, and, and look through the rules, give me feedback. Why do we do what we do? It's to break up those chains of associations. If you look like at, at La Clau Mouffe kind of discourse theory, I don't want to uh, force, like, make people think differently. That's not my job. I mean, I could be a priest if I want to do that, or maybe get children to like manipulate them, or, you know. But this is this. I'm not doing this kind of pervert um, uh, stuff. I'm um, I'm trying. What I'm trying to do is to. Uh, force people to take position by taking codes that are known and filling them with different content. They're irritated and then are thinking like, wait, what, what is my position about that? And so it's this like, like tendency, or like the, the, the double or the paradox notion of manipulating you to self-awareness, which or like self-positioning of things you didn't think about before. Um, Obviously, the opponent also should, um, and, I'm, and I'm thinking about Carl Schmidt here when I say opponent. I'm not saying enemy. I'm saying opponent because I'm not. I don't want to destroy him. I just want to, you know, do politics here. And so I want the person or the company or whatever to take a position herself um, and position herself, which often they don't. They just do PR, and then they have to demand that it wasn't them or whatever, whatever. And we also enter safe spaces. Um, if you look at this uh, thing, um, this is a campaign where we, we disguise the main party of Germany, the, the, the conservative ones. And in their name, we did a, a little video uh, of a little p village. We invented the party being there. We found a, a village where there is no such, such party. And we did a video in their name <coughs> and, and claimed that they want to get back to Christian values. They asked uh, Chancellor Merkel to stop uh, small arms trading. So it's in German, um, uh, so I skip it. But what happened is that it was picked up very well by uh, the international media. Obviously, they lost their values, right? So they want to bring them back. Uh, Radio Vatican was one of the most important ones. So there we did a website, we did a petition, we, we did an extra trashy website of themselves because they're, you know, this little village. 
um, and with, yeah, it still exists. It's called CDU Schwenke um, and a Facebook page. And we did a, had a lot of Facebook friends from the CDU itself. He had like last time he, it was his birthday. He doesn't exist, right? It's just an idiot who put all his portraits open source and for free use online. I mean, who does that? Um, so we used it and he got last birthday like 50 people saying happy birthday. He doesn't even exist. But, um, and they were all from the CDU. So, however, we did this press release and it, it uh, took off uh, online and, and it was the, the trending topic in Germany uh, for a moment. So the other thing we did to attack the weapon industry is we looked at where their trade the arm dealers in, in the US and they're on their website. It's very simple to get their address. And then we wrote uh, a recall. We just said in the name of uh, Heckler and Koch, you've got Donald Trump on power. So it's not a safe place anymore. We need you to send back the weapons. So they were very, very angry. And they didn't understand what's happening. Why those Germans with their, their, their basic rights and pacifism and that's... And one, you can't read all that, but it says like it must be Merkel supporters, which is true. We did a Merkel video, right? So this is like a weapon shop um, who like photographed the letter he got and he said, well, that's really well done. And he's really happy about it, actually. He says like fun, fun, fun. Um, he, but he understood it's a, it's a fake. Not everyone did. Like Heckler and Koch uh, put their German and US website completely black and they said, we are victims. So Heckler and Koch, the weapon manufacturer now, was a victim, which was quite funny. Um, or like cynical. And then we created a peace prize uh, in the name of the weapon industry um, and that was most of the biggest work we did in this area. So in the name of the weapon industry we gave a peace prize to the weapon industry. Um, <clears throat> which is, an, so we had to re-sync through their codes because it's a very closed entity. They only talk to themselves and politicians who give them the signatures, Germany being one of the biggest arm, like number four in the world of arm uh, exporting. So we had the price. Um, we, we rented a huge hotel uh, in, in this, I think, 14th floor. And uh, those are two actors from the Schauspiel Dortmund. And he is a, a, a rich young boy who really wants to do, you know, dominate and do something great. And the other one is just, we, so we had like really detailed personas. We had a really trashy website. But here's all those white folks I told you about that we had to invite as fakes. Uh, this is like someone who sang like peace songs. And for weeks I was just calling up the weapon industry. Like I talked to 60 different companies. And always as Silver Linings, that was the agency that was uh, organizing the prize for the ITSEC, which was a body who gave me money, which then again I had always these like, and if they really insist to know why they do it, I was like, yeah, you know, it's... His father is in the, in the industry of building houses and he's a friend of the Egyptian crown prince da, 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 and he wants to have an export product which uh, please don't tell anyone that this is the actual story behind it and they were like oh yes of course we understand you. So that's like we kind of like faked their modus operandi. And he came, that's the senior policy advisor of uh, ThyssenKrupp Marine Systems who is um, shipping uh, submarines to, to Egypt and to Israel, to Pakistan and to India, uh, to Indonesia, to like t dozens of, and they have corruption cases in Brussels and so on and so forth. I mean, so he came, <laughs> um, Mr. Stuve, and uh, from Zig Sauer, there was someone who wanted to come who then last minute didn't come. But it was, yeah, unfortunately, all the other 60 companies didn't send anyone. We also wrote like the exporting law. There's five different versions. People could vote on just two NATO states or not at all or just small weapons. Or it's very complicated. Like writing a law is not an easy thing. It's like, I mean, the first one is a complete, is like defending exportation of weapons completely. It's just one sentence, right? It's a very simple law. Um, but the more you start to differentiate to just the cops in nation states or just to nation states or then it becomes like six pages of, of text, which is extremely, every word counts. At least we got the, the social democrats to put it into their voting program that small weapons are not going to be exported and they're now in power. And what do the social democrats do usually? They betray us. So they, I don't believe they will do it. Like the problem with secret services is that secret services are very difficult to communicate with. They always neither confirm nor deny. Um, uh, which then we thought might be a chance, right? Uh, and the other thing is that whenever we work on them as activists, we are just uh, fear-mongering. And the more you talk about it, the more you feel, shit, we are really, really fucked. 
and uh, there's no way out of it. And uh, every crypto party you go to, you feel a bit empowered, but you re feel really, really fucked. So uh, we thought, how can we do like this positive narrative? And we created the exit organization for spies. Right now, thousands of people work in the shadows of the intelligence community. They don't ask questions. They follow orders, keep their heads down, do their work. But what happens when you see something you can't forget? When you realize that the system you are part of is chipping away at democracy every hour, every day. You feel stuck, overwhelmed. Some people have already made the decision to leave. Others are thinking about it every day. Intel Exit helps people break free from the intelligence community and build a new life. You expose yourself within the system, you ultimately could end up being forced out of the system. I remember confronting my immediate supervisor, the number three person, about what are we doing? We're in violation of the Constitution. Many Secret Service uh, employees are disillusioned. Why are we taking equipment that is traditionally foreign-facing, outward-facing, and we're now instrumenting our networks within the United States of America? If you are surveilling the population, you're all on the same side. Right? You want all the data, and you want to talk to people who have the most data. So the NSA is a nexus of surveillance for the world. It's whatever you could get away with. That was part of the game. And it was ever whatever would serve in the interest of national security. When one is forced to act against one's moral values, he can experience extreme levels of what we call cognitive dissonance. I had damals keine Hilfe. I had 10 years gebraucht, um, um to erkennen wofür ich bei der Staatssicherheit verantwortlich gewesen bin. I was radioactive because I'm questioning what are we doing? Where do you then go? Where does your life then, where do you recreate your life? What Intellexa does is help individuals transition from the world on the inside to the world on the outside. Wissen Sie, dieser Intellexa Verein ist wirklich eine gute Sache. The more you can move from the inside to the outside, the better you'll integrate into the real world. What is really great about Intellexit is that it helps people to confront their fears. So take it from me, if you're looking to get out, try Intellexit. Be smart. Exit intelligence now. Yeah, so we started that. We uh, took a big truck and we drove around the NSA. Um, and we went to their favorite lunch spot, uh, Cafe Joe's, gave them flyers. This is just next to one of the main bases in, in Germany where they collect all the data. Uh, it's in Mannheim. There's another one in, in the Clay Caserne. There's another one in um, uh, Darmstadt, which is a dagger complex. It's two NSA um, compounds. So we took a drone. Um, and you know how they do it in Iraq? They, they try to freeze them and send leaflets uh, for democracy. Uh, so we thought, let's uh, reenact that. But, you, I mean, what, so what we did is we tried to also reach out to the people living there, right, working there. Because usually if we, we don't do our crypto parties, they don't give a shit. Um, they do their next Trojan horse or whatever, whatever. So we tried to get in touch with them and talk about moral values and so on and so forth. We launched this campaign uh, one hour after the launch. There was a first agent uh, coming and he was by just by accident, I don't know, just in the park next to our office um, and met us. Um, 
like three weeks ago, he wrote me again. He's, he's he thought now he thinks I'm from the CIA and I killed his friend. However, it's a very complicated issue. There are many people who came to us who believe we're, we're true. We became true, actually. Um, all those who wanted to, to leak, we gave them, we, we forwarded them directly to journalists um, or to, like, we told them what options they have, like the German journalists, like Spiegel and Rechercheverbund and... We told them about WikiLeaks as well, and so on and so forth. I mean, we just said, we are artists and activists, we are not journalists. Please don't give us your data. Um, but uh, we helped them. We tried to get them medical support if they needed it. We tried to, you know, do what we could, but we understood we don't have the capacities for that. Um, they, we, you, you constantly don't know who, who is where, what reality is. They don't know if you're right, if you're true. They don't know if you're in a honeypot. Uh, well, you don't know if they just want to find out about your networks. And you know that they know that you know that they know and so forth. So it was a very funny, t uh, like, uh, yeah, adventurous time. And then we thought about how can we c continuously get, you know, into their compounds. Like, I mean, with the drone was one attack, van was another one. And then we thought, hey, so why not just calling them up? So we gathered 30,000 phone numbers of NSA, FBI, name it, DHS, CIA. And we created a little, like, uh, you know, like... Um, VPN, Raspberry Pi, voice over IP, asterisk, and uh, people could call them. So there's a list where you press one, and then the operator said, if you want to talk to a German spy from the private sector, please press one. Because So we differentiated between private sector, state level, and federal uh, agencies. Then people called them, and um, we so this toured around museums. I mean, this is why I call it Use Art as a Burn Barricade, uh, because I, I believe that what we have here uh, in Europe right now still is possibilities that certain civilians don't have if you're considered an artist and this is to do stuff that is otherwise illegal and <clears throat> I mean we launched Call a Spy on a journalist conference as an art project so we had like a double layer of uh, legal I mean if the cops would run into a journalist conference and they would then take an art project uh, they would really have a problem in Germany so, and nothing happened. And then we went to the Berlin Biennale and then went to Stockholm, I don't know what's the uh, Kunsthall Charlottenburg. It's, it's like an important, the important state museum. It's complicated. Then you have to take care that it's not seen as a symbolic gesture. But this is obviously, you call the real people. We also created um, a workshop where we, where we developed, uh, we helped people to understand how to manipulate on the phone. Like we invited a call center agent who was very good in that and we gave them classes, how to call them, how to get information out of them. So then we did a show where people could contest against each other. The game is simple. Our contestants will phone up uh, several of spies throughout this show, following specific challenges and tasks set by me. Hi, hi there. I'm, uh, this is Olivia Jones calling. Um, I have a few questions for you because um, I'm a grade school teacher at um, Garfield Elementary School in Forest Park, Illinois. Good morning, this is David. Good morning, this is Kevin Mitnick speaking. I'm from the US Fleet Cyber Command. Uh, I work in the Operational Signal Intelligence and I'm specialized in Dragnet surveillance. Victoria here and I'm a Canadian citizen and I just wanted to chat to another Canadian because I've been a little bit troubled um, reading about this recent hack at the NSA and I wanted to know that Canada's still got everything under control. I just told you I'm a grade school teacher. But I don't know that. I don't know you. But I'm, I just I just need to, I wanted, I thought this number was for getting information about, you know, how the government works in the, in the security department. You have, me, you have my desk number. I'm an intelligence analyst. Are you sitting in front of your computer? You have to check this thing for me uh, because there's like a Trojan horse going around. It's called Cyanide. And you have to see who is affected by it. It's like a, uh, introduced by Russian whistleblowers. Are you troubled by the hack too? It sounds like you are. Well, I'm not here in fact to discuss my personal feeling about that. Ma'am, yes? ma'am, you're not listening to me. You're a teacher, you're a good listener, right? The 
agency doesn't have any recommendations for citizens? No, we don't. At all. Like, we're just left out there in the wild, just make decisions about what tools we should be using to protect ourselves from being spied on and having our data stolen. You're also not listening very well because, I've, as I've tried to tell you, this is what I've already been through and no one calls back. <laughs> I'm really honored to talk to the Call Us By show contestants tonight. The game has only just started and you are already heroes in my eyes. Close to your computer, it's very urgent, like the, the safety of Obama relies on it. <laughs> you don't want that the same thing as, uh, happens as to JFK, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, do you have your mobile phone, maybe? <laughs> Hello? Oh. Exactly, that's it. So, we, that we try to, like, make fun out of spies and but still like change something and what we learned is uh, actually in South Africa one of my colleagues was there in a bar and met someone who works for the GCHQ and they had workshops everyone working at GCHQ had workshops to prepare themselves for us <laughs> so at least we are sure they talked about intellect I don't know if everyone had workshops but it definitely went there in the list internal communication they tried to defend themselves from this exit intelligence whatever, whatever, and yeah. <laughs> so there, there's some success, and uh, I'm sure they, they think about why people want them to stop and stuff. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much.